Live from the European Parliament in Strasbourg, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and this is what we have on the program for you, a Brexit disconnect. Why the EU and the UK can't even agree on the state of progress in critical negotiations. Missing in action, did Luxembourg intentionally try to humiliate an absent Boris Johnson? Snowden sanctuary, should France offer refuge to the wanted American whistleblower Edward Snowden? European pride, Commissioner-elect Johannes Hahn defends a new portfolio to protect the European way of life. And life after politics, a much maligned White House spokesperson spices up the dance floor in tonight's Raw Moment. All right, it is time to meet our panelists this evening in Strasbourg. We have Philippe Lambert. He's a Belgian MEP and vice chair of the Greens EFA group here. Hello, Philippe. Which of these stories are you watching closely tonight? Well, I'm worried that uh, Commissioner Hahn is still defending uh, basically a title that is indefensible, unless, of course, you share this vision that uh, migration is a threat to both internal security and or way of life, whatever that means. The controversy on that portfolio's name does continue. All right, and also with us is Nigel Farage. He's a British MEP and leader of the Brexit Party. What about you, Nigel? Oh, I think we're still <laughs> reeling from what happened in Luxembourg yesterday. Sure. I mean, the sheer level of insult. Forget the fact that it's Boris Johnson. It's the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And to be treated like that, well, I have to say, as a Brexiteer, thank you, Luxembourg. Well, that is one side of looking at it. And that is exactly where we are at beginning uh, this evening. Another mammoth Brexit debate will dominate the agenda here in Strasbourg tomorrow, with MEPs gathering for three more hours of discussion. And if yesterday offers any hints, well, it could get ugly. <laughs> Well, it wasn't quite the welcome he had hoped for. The British uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson arriving in Luxembourg, heckled by an angry crowd. Mr. Johnson was there to meet with Luxembourgish leader Xavier Bettel and Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. It was hoped that the meeting might break the deadlock. And for one side, there apparently was cause for optimism. Well, but uh, that sentiment, it wasn't shared. Well, over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of work. Uh, papers have been shared, but we are now in the stage where we have to start really accelerating the work. And that was the uh, agreement today at the, with, with Jean-Claude Juncker and with Michel Barnier. And uh, look, I don't want to get people's, you know, we've got to manage this carefully. Yes, there is a good chance of a deal. Yes, I can see the shape of it. But as I never tire of telling you, if we can't do a deal by then, and obviously we want to work very hard to do it, if we can't do it by then, then we'll make sure that we can come out on the 31st of October, deal or no deal. Well, that uh, sentiment, it wasn't shared by Mr. Juncker. The EU Commission released a statement after the meeting saying, President uh, Juncker recalled that it is the UK's responsibility to come forward with legally operational solutions that are compatible with the withdrawal agreement, and such proposals have not yet been made. Well, our political uh, editor, Darren McCaffrey, was in Luxembourg following uh, events yesterday. So let's cross over to him live now, Darren. So you were, you were there where all the action was. What was the conclusion, in fact, from yesterday's round of meetings? And what, does, what tone does it set for this week? Well, first of all, none of the fundamentals in this process, Tessa, have changed at all. Essentially, who do we believe? Do we believe uh, the UK government in London, who suggest that ultimately there are or is now an acceleration of those talks trying to get a deal without that issue of the Irish uh, backstop, that good and real progress is being made? Or do we believe the EU Commission, and indeed it seems some EU leaders, who suggest uh, there isn't or there hasn't been significant progress, that the backstop remains and that they still have not had any concrete elements uh, when it comes to these alternative arrangements uh, instead of the Irish backstop. And we have heard this perpetual to and in froing different arguments over the last uh, couple of weeks. And we here, uh, looking on and on the wiser about what is actually happening. Then we had the kind of theatre of yesterday, those protesters gathered outside 
uh, the Prime Minister's office in Luxembourg, booing and chanting down uh, Boris uh, Johnson. It was pretty embarrassing in some ways uh, for the British Prime Minister. He was stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, did he go ahead with that press conference with those protesters mere metres away and get drowned out by the noise? Or did he decide not to do it and get accused of bottling it in the end? And then to follow all of that, uh, we had uh, Javier Bettel, the Luxembourg Prime Minister, be more frustrated and more furious, I think, in his words about Brexit than I've seen any EU leader publicly speak about the state of affairs. And this is what he had to say to me when I put it to him that some in Downing Street potentially are seeing this as a sham negotiation that is really all about putting the blame on the European Union. I uh, wanted to thank Mr. Johnson, who was here today, for the exchange that we had. For me, it was important to listen to Prime Minister Johnson. This Brexit, it's not my choice. It's been a decision from a party. It was a decision from David Cameron to do it. They decide. They decide. I deeply regret it. But don't put the blame on us, because now they don't know how to get out of this situation, they put themselves in. Imagine you are a European citizen in London and you don't know how your future looks like. Imagine you are UK citizens living in Europe. You don't know if tomorrow you will need special agreements if you're able to stay in a country, if you can send your children to school. People want clarification and as soon as possible. So to speak about new delays, just to, put, to postpone things is not in the interest of our citizens. Now, was it, um, Tessa, essentially a deliberate uh, attempt by uh, the Luxembourg government to kind of embarrass the British Prime Minister? I'm not entirely sure it was. They clearly could have done more efforts, I think, to move those protesters away. Uh, in the end, uh, they didn't. And I think, ultimately, how you view what did happen yesterday depends what side you're on. If you don't like Boris Johnson, if you're amongst those kind of British protesters, you think, actually, you know what, he should have gone ahead with that press conference and gone through it, ultimately... Prime Ministers and politicians need to deal with protesters. It's part of the job. Uh, if you think the Luxembourg government acted in the wrong, were undiplomatic, they should have got rid of the podium and the flag, uh, well, you think that actually this will only help, in some ways, the Brexit cause in the United Kingdom. All in all, you know what? Another extraordinary Brexit day. We may have another one tomorrow. Jean-Claude Juncker and Michel Bonny addressing the Parliament here in Strasbourg before MEPs get a chance to vote on whether they would like to see a further extension to this process. It holds no actual weight in terms of uh, they've got no real power over it, but it will send a message about the frustration here amongst many politicians about the UK prolonging this possible Brexit extension into 2020. All right, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Darren McCaffrey there, you were shaking your head the whole time, Nigel. Yeah, uh, but, I was. But was it a mistake? I know how you feel about Mr. Bettel, but was it yeah. a mistake for Boris Johnson to not appear, in fact? Well, it's ludicrous, isn't it? I mean, earlier on in the day, there had been a press conference with uh, our Brexit secretary, Stephen Barclay, that took place inside the building. Why on earth were those podiums set up uh, within a few feet of baying protesters uh, when... The process was seen. The obvious thing to do was to move the press conference inside. That wasn't done. And I, I genuinely think that the Luxembourg Prime Minister chose to upstage and embarrass Boris Johnson. You think it was and, deliberate? Yeah, then. and for once, I, I will take issue with the excellent Darren McCaffrey. He said that how you view this depends which side of the argument you're on. I don't agree with that. I think that for any visiting head of state to have been treated in that way is a disgrace, regardless whether you're a Brexiteer or a Remainer. What do you think? Uh, he, was he grandstanding there, you know, using the opportunity to raise his own, own profile, Mr. Bettel, there? Well, on the one hand, I understand the frustration because there's many reasons to be frustrated by uh, the disingenuity of uh, Boris Johnson. On the other hand, he's the legitimate Prime Minister of the United exactly. Kingdom. Mm. Xavier Bettel is a standing Prime Minister of a EU member state. And we are in a difficult uh, negotiation with the United Kingdom. And I think that if you want a successful outcome in any negotiation, however, whatever you think of your opposite number, uh, you better not resort to humiliation. So, you, so, you so think I think it's unhelpful in the sense that, well, I think that if we want to be credible when we say that we want a successful outcome 
of the Brexit situation, well, or, or to limit damage as much as possible, we cannot be seen as worsening the situation. And this is what, what I deplore, because I think it plays in the hands of, uh, of, yeah, uh, of uh, Mr. Farage so and, a... and, and, and basically English nationalism. That, right. Because it, it, it allows some people to say, look, Look how the British Prime Minister is treated yeah. by a fellow these are EU head of... These are unreasonable people. They so demean I'm glad you have avoided And okay. they did demean Theresa May previously. Now they're doing it to Boris Johnson. And it, as you say, a lot of us think, it's not just English nationalism, by the way, the Welsh are very Eurosceptic too. And it does allow us to say, look, this is a waste of time. Far better to leave with a clean break. But do you acknowledge the frustration rules. on this side, this side of the channel? I do. To, to, to some extent, I do. Um, because... It must be quite confusing dealing with Boris Johnson. So what Johnson. is the state of negotiations, really? If we look at what happened there, is that a sign of actually the souring relations and the real state of negotiations? Because it's a he said, he said. We don't really know what the state of negotiations is. Well, Boris Johnson says... himself is in a very odd position. You know, he condemned the withdrawal agreement. He twice voted against it. Yeah. He then voted for it. Yeah. And now he wants to amend it. So it is actually quite difficult to know where Boris really stands on I this. Agree. I mean, the truth of it is, the truth of it is, what Boris Johnson is trying to do is this, and he's in a very tight spot. It's difficult for him back in, at home in Westminster. What he wants to do is go to the summit on the 17th, 18th of October, get some change to the backstop, and then put it back to the House of Commons. That's his agenda. But, is, but are things between the two sides so bad at this point that a deal which Boris Johnson seems to be optimistic about is not even realistic? No, I, what I think is that Boris Johnson has been mostly communicating since he became Prime Minister. So he... His story is that I'm doing my utmost to get an agreement. You believe him? No, of course not, because, well, I have direct feedback from all negotiating team and there's nothing concrete put on the table. So uh, it would also appear that the British negotiating team has been changed, <coughs> so the new team needs to actually understand the, the, so is it the situation. Spin? Is it all spin to make uh, it the... From, from Boris Johnson, it's obvious. And he needs, well, basically, his storyline will be, I have done my utmost to find an agreement, but these bloody Europeans are not moving an inch, and so I'm taking the country out of the European Union without a deal. I, I think that this think is he's gonna do strategy. That. I, I, wish you, I, mean, I wish he was, because that, yeah, would, of end course. <laughs> no, because that would end it, and we can move on. Um, but I, I have to say, I, frankly, if Boris Johnson was to go for a no-deal, clean-break Brexit, uh, there are just too few in his own Conservative Party that would support it. So I, I don't see it, but, hey, the truth of it is, none of us actually know But what do you right think now. he's doing, Nigel, if you don't... I, think no, I think, don't actually, I think, actually, he will... Uh, I mean, look, the truth of it is that to deal with the border question in Northern Ireland with technological solutions is not very difficult. Uh, and You'll he, say so. Well, of course it's not difficult. I mean, we're living in the 21st century, hmm. you know. I know. You know. You know, we can track a packet of bacon coming from Denmark and see what supermarket it's being sold in, so we can deal with it. But we things. don't know whether it's bacon. I, I think he will. I think he will. Uh, I think he will put something very firm on the table, but he'll do it much nearer the 17th of October. To take summer. people by surprise, basically. Well, it's a negotiation, and both sides will play their cards the way they choose to. But I, 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 I personally hand. think, I personally think he will try to push an amended withdrawal agreement through Parliament. I don't think he's got any other options. And the EU's response, if, if they're, you know, they want a deal, and if Boris yeah. Johnson comes at the last minute, you well, get Well, basically, deal. there's two options, the initial backstop <coughs> or the current backstop. So an all-UK backstop or a Northern Ireland Limited backstop. The two options are on the table. If he prefers the former one, fine by us, and we step back. So. Nominally, we do change the withdrawal agreement because we revert to the initial proposal of the backstop. If that is the choice of the British government, fine by us. The question is, does he have a majority in the House of Commons for that? That is the key yeah, question. Yeah. And those of us that are critical of the withdrawal agreement would say that the backstop is just part of the problem, right. not the whole so problem. I suppose the big thing to watch now will be the summit here on the 17th in Brussels. I think that's a very, very important moment. Oh, right. I have to say, to, to me, I think that extension is, is now the most likely outcome of this. OK, well, you have heard from our panel here and what they think of that empty podium and also what they think Boris Johnson is doing. But what do you think? Our team in the Cube have been finding out this side of the story. Alex, what are pe people saying? Well, hello to you, Tessa. Hello, of course, to your panel as well. Well, yeah, it is that question of whether this was uh, Boris Johnson was the victim of petty podium politics or if he was being uh, more like the incredible sulk. And I think it is fair to say, depending on, uh, might disagree with Mr Farage there, depending on who you voted for, where you signed on this, there are mixed feelings. Although there is some nuance. Let me bring out perhaps some of that nuance. Some people saying that even if they disagree with Mr Johnson, they still thought the whole keeping the podium there, keeping the union flag there with the British not there was a bit 
bit dodgy, shall we say. Luca Pina here is saying, don't like Boris, nor Brexit, but the unilateral press conference was bitter, he says. We need more diplomacy, especially against what he's calling their, uh, you know, a sovereign nationalists like Boris Johnson in his terms. There were some people, though, who saw this as symbolic. Let's have a look at what Alan here, he says, this is the symbol, uh, this is a symbolic image of Britain's new standing in the world, where a nation like Luxembourg can effectively hold the future of the UK trade agreements, trade relationships in their hands, and embarrass the UK, or at least empty podium them here. But also saying here, that it was Boris Johnson who was being rude by not turning up to the press conference. So quite a lot to unpack there. Then we've got other people, though, on the other side, like Tristan Clark. Very uh, strong message here. It's fair to say I think he's a Boris backer. Good on Boris. Exactly why we are leaving the EU. Stuff him. There you go. That's uh, Tristan's view anyway. So you can see one podium image, a diversity of opinions. These are all comments, um, this comment here anyway, from our Euronews Facebook page. But we also reached out to, to hear directly from you. And Nia is one of those who sent us a video message about her take. Let's have a listen to Nia. I think the overriding thing in all this, as it always is with Boris Johnson, he refuses to engage with the public, with journalists, and to be held to scrutiny and answer questions. A failure to answer questions, a failure to stand up to scrutiny? Well, not if you ask Stephen Canning. He sent us a video uh, directly to us here in the Cube. Of course, you can get involved in any conversations on raw politics and in the Cube, remember, as well. This is what Stephen had to say about this podium debacle, for podium debate, I should say. Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister of Great Britain. They're supposed to be an ally of Luxembourg. I ask, would Britain treat Luxembourg's Prime Minister or the leader of any other country the way that they tre treated Boris Johnson? No, they wouldn't. Empty podiuming someone in that, such a manner is completely against diplomatic protocol. It's actually completely, frankly, quite rude. So, finger pointing, a very undiplomatic debate about uh, diplomacy at the highest levels. As you can see, uh, people as divided on Facebook as it seems they were on your uh, sofa a little earlier. All right, thank you for that. Alex and her team at the Cube cer certainly uh, has raised a lot of reaction uh, in your part. You think it has helped in general, really has helped the Brexit side? Yeah, I do. I just think the EU and the, some, of the, some of the EU leaders just look like wholly unreasonable people uh, and, and, and rude, discourteous, not worth doing business with. All right, uh, last comment on that. I went into thing. politics because democracy for me is the way to uh, debate our differences, and I respect that some people believe the United Kingdom should be out of the EU. Some believe the opposite. But what I hope is that the democratic debate is about facts and arguments and, and respect for the other people's positions. And when I see stuff like uh, Stuffham mm. or other, well, uh, uh, harsh language, if that is where the democratic debate is headed, well, then I really worry about our future. And this is why when we are vested with political responsibility, well, we have a role uh, of, well, we have a responsibility of leading by example. Right. In being well, decent, this even is open. to well, people. Tell that to Luxembourg. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It has opened a bigger discussion. It has opened a bigger discussion. I do not share many ideas of Mr. Farage, yet Mr. Farage is an elected MEP, mm. and his legitimacy is not less than mine. So I have to treat him with decent respect, even though I disagree fundamentally with most of the... I'm not of seeing you policies. agreeing this much. <laughs> well, it's a remarkable... It's a matter well, of respect no, no, for I mean, democracy. How, how we conduct democracy is very important. Absolutely. All right, and we do want to know what you think. We will be having uh, this conversation on your call after the programme. We'll ask you, did Luxembourg behave badly? So do get in touch with us after the programme. All right, well, all of that, this is all happening as there's drama on the other side as well as the UK Supreme Court begins hearings over Mr Johnson's suspension of Parliament after a lower court in Scotland already ruled the move to be unlawful. Well, demonstrators gathered outside while uh, inside judges heard how Mr. Johnson is accused not only of shutting down Parliament in order to silence MPs and stifle the Brexit debate, but also of misleading the Queen in order to do so. I mean, this is a whole other part of the story. I'll start with you, Nigel. I mean, how, regardless of the outcome of this, how damaging is this or is it damaging for oh, Boris Johnson? I think it's horrifying. It's even happening. I mean, we had, a, we had a high court in London who said, well, of course, Boris Johnson is perfectly entitled to call... It's called a Queen's speech. It's, it's a laying out 
of the legislative programme, and it normally happens every year. It ha this hasn't happened for a couple of years. In fact, our Parliament has sat continuously for the longest time since the 1640s. Mm -hmm. So nothing very unusual. And the argument that what Boris has done is shut down parliamentary debate is nonsense. We've had three years of parliamentary debate. All this act did was to stop 10 to 15 hours of parliamentary That's debate. That's not how a lot of people... What, what do you think? Do you agree this is not no, to I don't shut agree. down? No, uh, I don't agree. I think that when you reach moments that are absolutely crucial to your country's future, you cannot just shut out parliament. And even, even if the parliament has had the longest continuously, uh, uh, continuous session for ages, I mean, these are not just normal times for the UK. These are exceptional times. And in exceptional times, a well, normal government that wants to, the to have already. the backing of its parliament. But even if all the arguments have been, have been shared, don't forget it in democracy. The highest legitimacy lies with the people. They are the real sovereign. And they elect the parliament. And the government is accountable to parliament. That's how it works. And it's not parliament that is accountable to government. So I think this was a big mistake. But you know, if we want to have more parliamentary debate, they could have all come back from Tuscany slightly earlier in August. They chose not to do so. We could, in October if necessary, sit all through the weekend, sit all through the night. I have seen no one putting these proposals forward. I repeat, by doing this, we're losing 10 to 15 hours of parliamentary debate. It's minimal. All right. And so when you're watching this from the outside, the, the Supreme Court ruling and you're lo looking at it, how is this going to impact what's happening on this side? I uh I'm not a specialist of, uh, on the, result. of the UK <laughs> constitutional law, sure. but I respect... Regardless uh, of the outcome. I respect uh, the judiciary and it's for the Supreme Court to say the law. And, well, whatever their conclusion is, uh, I think that politicians have to respect it. As we say, theatre and drama all around here. And as you were saying, Brexit is once again overshadowing proceedings this week. But there's actually more to Strasbourg than Brexit. And here is what else is going down. La rentrée Strasbourg style. For the first time since the summer break, MEPs are back in town with the climate on the agenda. Today, the European Parliament debated its position on next week's Climate Action Summit. World leaders are set to descend on the UN in New York in a bid to ramp up the global response to climate change. Summer of destruction in the Amazon. Thousands of wildfires devastated the continent's rainforests. Emmanuel Macron put it at the top of the agenda of last month's G7 summit. In Strasbourg today, MEPs discussed what the EU can do to help the region. And giving the green light, Christine Lagarde will become the next head of the European Central Bank, steering the EU's monetary policy over the next eight years. MEPs formally approved the former IMF chief's candidacy for the ECB, making Ms. Lagarde the first woman to take on the role. I wish you could see reactions here, because Nigel again <laughs> shaking his head while that was playing. Well, Christine we Lagarde, I mean, just, Lagarde. Ex just extraordinary. I mean, uh, you know, she's got no proper training to do this job whatsoever. I think she's a really bad choice. Is that it? stopping her from doing a uh, Look, I, I think, you know, whatever you think of the Euro project and the damage it's done to the Mediterranean, I think Draghi understood uh, the economics of this. I, I have no, absolutely no confidence that she does at all. I don't think she's a good choice. What do you think, Philippe? She's not a trained economist. She's a lawyer, and you do not uh, decide on the economy only through law but of course there's a lot of expertise in the European Central Bank uh, that she can draw upon so on balance when I see uh, how the IMF evolved under her tenure I think that uh, there's realization that the kind of uh, orthodox austerity policies that have been advocated by the IMF uh, uh, are well the fact that these policies are actually wrong uh, starts to be recognized at least faster in the IMF under Christine Lagarde than at the ECB. And so if she can bring some of that fresh air in the ECB, I think we have made fresh a step air, forward. Fresh air, so pretty much, uh, well, some, broke, some are saying politicians at the, the helm. She broke all the rules at the IMF. The IMF should never have been involved in the Eurozone bailout. That was under and, Dominic and, Strauss-Kahn, that and, was and, not and, under and her. And she, she allowed the whole thing to be subverted. So we know she's a supporter of the European political project. Absolutely, but it, but so it, am I. But, but, there is a, but there is a downturn coming, there is a danger of a downward deflationary spiral, and we, as we saw with Japan, with the lost decade, mm. you know, dealing with that is yeah, not easy. Yeah, but that's not because of and the I, central and, bank. And I think that, I, all I'm saying is this, there, are, there would have been better people, more highly qualified to do the job than her. Quick yes or no, are you confident Christine Lagarde can navigate through this downturn? I voted her confirmation, so uh, uh, I think that, well, in balance, uh, mm -hmm. well, 
we can support her and we'll see uh, what comes out of it. What okay. I sense is that between du during her tenure, eight years, we are going to see the next Eurozone crisis. And uh, mm. it will take more than the response of the ECB to face it. If we don't strike very uh, groundbreaking political decisions, so if politicians don't take responsibility, then the euro is done. And where will the UK be then when the net down turns? Not in it's the euro, right. thank no, goodness. No, normally not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, coming up on Raw Politics, whistleblower Edward Snowden sets his sights on France. Should Europe take him in? Plus, from the White House to the dance floor, Donald Trump's former press secretary shimmies his way back into the public eye. That's in tonight's Raw Moment. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, after six years in exile, Edward Snowden says he would be happy to leave Russia and move to France. Speaking to French radio France Inter, the U.S. whistleblower said that he would, quote, love to see Macron roll out an invitation, end quote. Now, in a separate interview with German broadcaster ZDF, Snowden was also asked whether he fears Russian President Vladimir Putin would one day deprive him of his hospitality. So well, back. he could, unfortunately, uh, and so long as Europe uh, has a, 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 a policy where they won't defend whistleblowers uh, against the United States, but will only uh, protect them uh, against Saudi Arabia or China or Russia, um, we're always going to have this problem. And I, I think that's one of the saddest lessons from this story. What does it say to the next whistleblower and what does it say to the world? All right, joining us here in the studio to discuss this, we have Vile Ninisto, a Finnish MEP with the Greens EFA group here, and our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, from another part of Parliament to the set now. Okay, let's talk about this. Um, straightforward, should the EU accept Edward Snowden? Should France accept Edward Snowden? I would say yes. Uh, it uh, was our position uh, a few years back that he would... Uh, uh, have a chance to seek asylum and probably get that because there is risk that he doesn't get a fair treatment in the US. And at the expense of possibly US-EU relations, you know, is somewhere writing at this, incurring I mean, the wrath. Human rights are included even to whistleblowers and, and people like Snowden, so he is not excluded from those rights. All right, what do you think about the story, Darren? Well, I think what's interesting, first of all, I mean, Edward Snowden's been trying to get into France for quite a long time. In 2013, I, mean, he, I think. He, he yeah, he tried to Hollande. seek uh, asylum under Francois Hollande. Uh, this is a new attempt under Emmanuel Macron, or trying to reach out. Uh, there were rumours at the time, actually, back in 2013, it was pressure from uh, Vice President Joe Biden at the mm. time, who is potentially going to be the Democratic nominee uh, next time round, who put pressure on Francois Hollande not to allow Edward Snowden in. Um, I mean, you know, it's going to be really, really difficult. Uh, I mean, I think it's very unlikely that Emmanuel Macron is going to allow this to go through, not least of all because he has spent so much time over the last couple of months trying Why to butter think? up to President Trump to kind of put the, that relationship, uh, which has been in trouble before, back into difficulty for Edward Snowden, I'm not entirely so sure why you think why he that would. is going to... You, you're saying, Darren, that that's going to be a key... Like, it will oh, of course it would be. decisions of governments yeah. here. I mean, unfortunately, that's probably true, that there's going to be political pressure from the states, and, and, and the question is how much it affects it... European decision-making. Uh, I would imagine that, that uh, President Trump is a bit harder on these issues than that Obama was kind of like becoming more lenient towards the end of his I mean, period. you have here the parliament, you, you know, voting in, signing in mm. this whistleblower protection law. And then if, mm. you, if a decision like that is made, of course, here we, we don't know what decision would be made. But if indeed you're, uh, the relationship with, the Amer with America comes first, what kind of message is that sending? I think it's a bad message. We have to show that we stand up for these rights also when it comes to whistleblowers. And I think it's also very interesting another side of the story is that Snowden was saying that he is prepared to go to the US if he gets a fair trial right. and that's a very good point that even the whistleblowers in, in uh, a Western democracy and a, a, a country ruled by rule of law should have a fair trial. And there are question marks to that uh, when it comes and actually, to the And US. actually, he said the saddest part of this is he, an American whistleblower can be free to say what he thinks in Russia rather mm. than in Well, we'll in see. Europe. We'll have to That's see how long that, that Russian, <laughs> as you pointed out, hospitality lasts for. I think in the end, though, of course, I mean, you know, most European nations are very firm allies of the United States. He has clearly broken American law. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most, most of us except that the American justice system is pretty fair. Um, and on those bases, I mean, it would be pretty impossible, I think, for them to essentially harbour an asylum seeker, given the fact that he is judged to be a criminal in a close ally. 
Right. But I guess the secrecy around this, this, this legislation and, and, and uh, 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 the way U.S. has pursued uh, uh, terror, terrorism in, in the past has created a kind of like uh, situation where you can't really rely on them being fair on these issues. Okay, well, we did ask uh, other members of the European Parliament here earlier whether the continent should take in Edward Snowden. Let's take a listen to what they said. It's not an easy, straightforward question, uh, but uh, definitely Europe needs to beef up its protection of whistleblowers. Uh, as a human being, and in principle, yes. But then when it comes uh, to technical details and how we can ensure and guarantee his uh, uh, security, there's uh, quite a lot of questions unanswered. Yes. Quite, um, quite simply, he's a political refugee as far as I'm concerned, and he should be granted asylum complicated question actually I don't have a really clear answer answer on that uh, it's, it's a di difficult matter it's, it's not something I'd rather not talk about it at the moment that's right I think I miss out on that one I don't I would like to do a lot more on the research on do you think it will put the EU US relationship at risk if the EU accepts Edward Snowden uh, certainly uh, but uh, so does the climate crisis at the moment, so does uh, the debate about uh, trade wars. I think, as the recent times have shown, EU-US relations can take all sorts of um, turbulent decisions, but right is right, and the right thing for the European Union to, in this instance, is to grant asylum to a political refugee. I mean, to be honest, normally it's really easy to get MEPs to talk, but it was quite difficult to get people to comment on that. that, yeah, and I, that really and I, well, I think that's notable in the sense that essentially Edward Snowden is a divisive character amongst some. So there are big supporters of his who think he, you know, he's a hero and he needs to be protected. Uh, there are a lot of people who think he's broken the law and should go to prison. But there are an awful lot of people, probably the majority of people in the middle, actually, you know what, are pretty apathetic about it. They don't really know or understand what he did and they're not really that terribly concerned about his future. Oh, and I would still say that the majority opinion in Europe rightly so thinks that Snowden's actions as whistleblower have made the world safer place and, and better place for individuals when it comes mm. to their protection from the governments and, and the secrecy involved in these issues. So, mm. so if you take that context into account, the Europeans should sure. be still reminded of that, that, that Snowden has played a role in that uh, development. Yeah, indeed. But yeah, indeed, he is such so divisive that it was really hard to get people to answer. OK, well, let's move on now and start with a question. When have you ever heard of a country fighting a court battle to not be paid taxes? Let's take a look. They say taxes are one of life's certainties, but maybe not always. American tech giant Apple is appealing an EU ruling ordering it to pay 13 billion euros in back taxes to Ireland. But here's the twist. Apple's got the backing of Ireland itself. It was back in 2016 that Brussels found Apple was taking unfair advantage of Ireland's low corporate tax rate and benefiting from illegal state aid. Apple must recover up to 13 billion euros in unpaid taxes. Three years on and it's now up to Europe's second highest court in Luxembourg to decide whether Apple must write that check to Ireland, uphold the EU decision and Ireland's competitive business policy could be derailed, with Dublin likely to face even more claims that it is, in fact, a tax haven. Saying no to 13 billion euros there. And then Pati some academics Particularly when say, you're in an awful lot of debt, it exactly. must be said as some well. Exactly. Some academics are saying that Ireland is the world's biggest corporate tax haven. So is that what this is all about? Well, I think there are two things at play uh, which are slightly almost contradictory in some ways. First of all, Ireland wants to not betray itself as a tax haven. It wants to get away from this uh, reputation. Uh, hence why... You know, it's fighting. But this what it's doing, it's, it's forward fighting this court case in, right. in a sense. But the second reason it's also fighting this court case is that it wants to protect its position, which is essentially it wants to still be attractive to companies like Apple and exactly, Google. Exactly, because tax rate is still twelve point five percent, isn't it? Mm. Quite corporate tax rate, yeah. so it, it doesn't change anything. So. What do you think Ireland is up to? Well, I think Ireland is up to trying to play both the 
the country that has a fair tax system, they would like to give that impression and at the same time lure in companies like Apple. And I think Commission is here on the mor morality side that it's clear that Apple has been giving a very, very lucrative deal to come to Ireland and, and most likely uh, such benefits would have not been available to other companies of smaller size. So there is a very strong case for the Commission and if they would lose this into court, that would put a lot of European public pressure to Ireland and the European governments to actually increase tax harmonization. So Ireland would lose even right. if they would win the case. So are they just trying to have their cake and eat it too? Is that I mean, I mean that, that fair? I think, yes, that people would <laughs> accuse, I, I'm not going to say that myself, but people would accuse Ireland of doing that. But be in no doubt that this is going to be a big, big battle in the future, particularly France are very keen on clamping down this what people would call tax avoidance uh, for by multinational companies. It is also an issue that has been a touchstone of other governments across Europe. And I suspect Ireland and other countries, because it's not just Ireland and the EU, but other countries too, will come under pressure to change their tax systems. All right. And still coming up on the programme, European Pride. Austrian Commissioner Johannes Hahn defends the controversial job title that got Brussels talking. Our interview is up next. Welcome back to more politics. So one of Ursula von der Leyen's new commissioners has defended this decision to name one of her top posts protecting the European way of life. Johannes Hahn, the incoming budget commissioner, believes that there is nothing wrong with the title and we should in fact promote the European way of life. Well, he sat down with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, to speak about this and a lot of other issues. Let's take a look. One of the new posts that Ursula von der Leyen has created called protecting our European way of life. Do you understand what that means? As a current commissioner, not only for enlargement, but also for the neighbourhood, I have uh, learned how attractive uh, Europe is, how attractive uh, the European way of life is. In Europe, everybody can pursue his or her uh, interests, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, reassembling, etc. But the current commission president, your boss, Jean-Claude Juncker, told Euronews that he thinks it's a bad idea. Do, do, do you think that Ursula von der Leyen shouldn't change her mind on this? I mean, she was presenting her um, programme in early July. And exactly this, uh, protecting the European way of life, was one of her, uh, so to say, main areas, main topics. And nobody was discussing about it. Only a couple of days ago, it, it, it became a topic. And it was um, um, reduced to the question of migration. Migration and dealing with it is one of the many, many elements covered by this dossier. And to be honest, to offer asylum, to, to, to have a, a proper um, assessment procedure based on rule of law, also this is part of our European way of life. We have rule of law, we have standards where people can rely on so, it. So it sounds like you think that she should stick by this title? Of course, and I think we have to promote the European way of life. Yesterday in a debate amongst our new colleagues, I said, I remember when I was a child, a, a, a teen or a twin, <coughs> we were really admiring the American way of life. I think since 20 years, nobody is talking about the American way of life, the American dream. Things have changed there. But uh, I think we can be proud, we should be proud, and we should be more self-confident about the European way of life. We looked at that picture of all of you the other day, and there is now gender equality, which I assume you, you welcome. But what there wasn't is just every single one of those commissioners was a white face. Is that not a bit embarrassing, almost shameful for the European Union? that there are no commissioners and never have been a commissioner that is non-white? Well, not today, not in this commission, but it's not excluded that it will be in the future. It depends also, on the, 2019. It, it depends also on the political structure in our member states. Most important thing is, uh, so to say, the quality, the expertise of candidates. And uh, we should not differentiate. Uh, is it uh, somebody from this or this ethnic group uh, I think, indeed, Europe is colourful. Again, we should be proud of it. We, it's part of our European way of life, and therefore I'm pretty confident that next time uh, the picture might be much more colourful than today. 
Well, back with us uh, to talk about this is uh, Ville Ninisto, a Finnish MEP with the Greens EFA Group and our political editor. You just saw Darren McCaffrey. I'll start with you, uh, Ville, because you were reacting um, as he was speaking. You said, that's old language. What do, what do you mean by old I language? I mean, it feels very 19th century uh, that, you know, he doesn't even see the question of, of multiculturalism, that, that there are minorities in Europe that should be also represented, not just national state level issue, that one only one person from each member states represents very very wide U Europe so I think that that uh, commission should address this issue and th think about it also that they they represent all of European Union and the fact that he pr defended the protecting the European way what do you think about that does he have a point? I think that's also very bad language uh, Lenin famously had a, a quote that uh, there are people who are useful idiots for for communism's rise that that are helping them by chance and the commission and some of the right-wing parties in Europe are helping the extreme light and right populists by using their language and ha giving them a chance to redefine that there is only one way, way of living in Europe. Mm -hmm. There is not. European values are something that are shared here and human rights and ro rule of law and, and rights of individuals uh, are the values. But that's not a way of life. Okay, that's, but Darren, that's you met Mr. Hahn and you maybe you could give us context, insight into what... Well, so, so two things. First of all, I think we thought possibly this time last week, particularly after Jean-Claude Juncker talk, talked to Euronews and said that he did not like this title of the European mm -hmm. way of life, that the pressure might get so great on Ursula von der Leyen that she might well change. There have been hints right. that she had done. Clearly, with Hans' intervention, uh, that seems that it's not going to happen. In fact, Manfred Weber today said... Is there someone in this room talking to the press who wants to live the Chinese way of life or the African way of life or the American way of life? I want to live the European way of life. So they're coming no to her defense. Sign they're backing down on that. And just very briefly on the race issue, you know, there's been a big, big uh, problem, I think, with kind of race and religious issues across the European Union over the last couple of years, if not decade. And in 2019, not of anyone of colour um, in the Commission. You did bring that up in it's, that it's, interview. It's not. Not ideal. Either. All right. Well, coming up still, uh, earlier we talked about Boris Johnson's empty press conference podium. So did Luxembourg's leader behave badly by carrying on without him? Your call is coming up after this program. We want to hear from you. Number is on your screen, 0800-3333-7002. The hashtag is still Raw Politics, and you can look for us on Skype. Our lines are opening soon. Should protecting our European way of life post be changed? I think this is like a heritage that we can protect. It's not a bad way, it's not a racist thing. It will be sending the signal that we don't want you, and I don't like that. Should restaurants be able to deny free water? Access to water is one of the human rights. For one small glass of water, it was four euro. Four euro? Four euro. I go about with one of these, uh, and I put fresh water in it all the time. In Belgium, they cannot give the water for free. The government is taking so huge taxes, it's impossible to survive. Oh, I'm, so, still, so. I'm still angry about the water. I'm not oh, even joking. That's, that was angry, such but that's not tonight. Topic. No, it, it's not. So those were the highlights that you just saw from Brussels, but we're doing it again tonight here in Strasbourg. At the same time, so a different location now. 7 p.m. Central European time and 6 p.m. if you're in the UK and Ireland. Of course, Darren is hosting tonight and he will be joined by Belinda de Lucy from the Brexit Party. So Darren, not water tonight, but what not are we water talking tonight. about? Uh, no, we're talking about uh, Boris. We're talking about Edward Snowden. And we're also talking about... Diversity, I think. Diversity. Right. Right. Race in the European Commission. Well done, Tessa. Let's have a look at the hot topics tonight. <laughs> this, the image which sparked a scandal, a podium gate, as it's been branded. <laughs> Boris Johnson pulling out of a planned press conference with Javier Bettel due to a small but noisy protest. Mr Johnson's Luxembourgish host pressed ahead without him apparently unable to move the press conference away from the clouds. Javier Vettel has been accused of grandstanding. But what do you think? Did Luxembourg behave badly? Edward Snowden, the whistleblower who leaked information about the US government's mass surveillance program. Having spent the past six years living in exile in Russia, he's now calling on France to grant him political asylum. Should Europe take in Edward Snowden? And Ursula von der Leyen's new team of commissioners may be equal in terms of gender, but not so much when it comes to racial diversity. 
one commissioner had this to say. Europe is colourful. Again, we should be proud of it. We, it's part of our European way of life and therefore I'm pretty confident that next time uh, the picture might be much more colourful than today. So we want to know, is the European Commission too white? Come on Europe, get involved and have your say. Did Luxembourg behave badly? Should Europe tick in Edward Snowden? And is the European Commission too white? This is your call. And you know what to do, uh, pick up the phone. It is free, 00800 333 You can email us at rawpoll at euronews.com. Uh, we'd love to see you on Skype, as we did last week, or indeed use the hashtag rawpolitics on Facebook or Twitter. OK, so let's uh, ask Belinda about uh, the podium gate, as uh, some are calling it. Oh, what, what do you think uh, happened there? Do you think that Luxembourg behaved badly in this case? Well, from our point of view, um, you know, Brexit for us was never a rejection of Europe or our wonderful European friends. It was merely that we believe that um, it, it wasn't in the best uh, the UK's best democratic interest to stay part of the political unions and institutions anymore. So for us, we're, we're all very friendly and we want to maintain those friendly relationships. So targeting and, and humiliating uh, a leader of, of a friend, um, I think backfired um, and, and proves a lot of, uh, of what we have to say about a sort of an arrogance and out of touch um, elite just believing that they can um, squash and censor or humiliate or, or demonize. Or Nigel a, Farage a, earlier was here, he said thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, to thank that. you. In they, fact, he allowed yeah, the I think, demonization I think, of Brexit. I think we have to be a little bit careful because I, mean, you know, I was there yesterday. I have to say, I don't think it was a deliberate attempt on behalf of the Luxembourg government to somehow humiliate Boris Johnson. I, you know, they didn't organize those protesters. Now, they could have probably handled the security situation a little better, as in they probably could have closed off the square where the protesters were. Should Wouldn't have been that difficult. But all I would suggest is, I don't think they're used to dealing with this. Right. You know, it's a small nation. They're not used. This does not happen every day of the week. It's not like but London some suggesting or that the Paris. podium should, be, so, should have been removed. Well, I think. I think well, okay. So I think on the protesters, I think to 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 say it was orchestrated or they did it deliberately right. wrong. In terms of the podium, you know, that's diplomatic to and froing. It didn't look good, and they probably should have done it. Um, but I think it's wrong to say... I, I don't get the impression that it was this kind of orchestrated plan. Well, 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 then, then tell me, what um, would have happened if it had rained? I mean, are they so small that they've never coped with a, with a press conference uh, outside and it rains and they have to move somewhere well, else? Well, so one of the journalists went so, inside and the press, conf the press room is pretty small and there were 119 they would have coped. 19, they would have 19 journalists. Uh, possibly, possibly, but also all I would suggest is Boris Johnson is a prime minister. He right. is a politician. He should be able to handle a couple of protests. And what does it say about the British that they can't even give oh. it a good old well, recce? Well, the debate is already well, starting. And this is, this, okay. is the other, this is the other <laughs> thing, you know, you, the British civil service may be the best in the world, there. and, you know, no, they later. can't organise it. But, but may I just make okay. a quick, very quick point? You know, I, I felt really ashamed the way Sadiq Khan treated uh, the president, well, whatever you think about him, and, the, and his office when he came over to London and did the so you horrific feel the same And I actually now. think Khan set a nasty tactic standard on how to humiliate leaders you don't agree with. Don't, no, no dialogue, let's humiliate, and that's the wrong way to go about it. Well, we it. do want you to join in this conversation, this debate, especially if you're from Luxembourg, actually. We want to know what yes. you think about this story that's kind of blowing up uh, now. Okay, so join Belinda and Darren just after the program. Well, before we go, we have time for tonight's Raw Moment, which tonight proves that there is life after politics. Sean Spicer became a household name as the White House spokesperson under Donald Trump. Now, much of the coverage was not positive, but Mr. Spicer may be having the last laugh. Let's take a look. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. Where you might be hearing something is more on the timing and the wording of stuff, the conclusions everybody in the administration is agreed upon. Well, I think obviously in the context of an entire administration, um, there is a lot that I think we feel very proud that we've gotten off, gotten taken, done and taken care of. I will see you on Monday. <laughs>
that was Sean Spicer I there on Dancing with the Stars, in fact. I loved it. It's like, you yeah. know. Um, I, um, I think great. And actually, he said he couldn't dance in an interview earlier on that week. I thought he did pretty well. I think he did really well. I mean, too. dancing to the Spice Girls is not difficult, but I still think he did pretty and well. And always up for a career change. All right, thank Tessa you very much for joining. For Join Darren. In Hang on. Right Join now. Darren in a few I seconds. A minute. Bye for now.